Hello and welcome to this live webinar on hacking habits. If you're watching this live on Friday night, uh, or maybe if you're watching this later, as most of you will be, I'd love for you guys to comment below and let me know what a current habit is that you would like to build, or maybe a bad habit that you would like to get rid of. And we'll talk about these and we'll address these over the next half hour. And also over the next few days, I'll help you with some tools, tactics, and strategies to address these habits. So what are we gonna be talking about during this webinar? Basically, we are talking about how to make the good things in your life run automatically, to put the good things on autopilot, and to take some of the bad things in your life and take them off autopilot to make you more, more aware of the things that you don't wanna be doing in your life. So again, guys, if you are just joining us, thank you for joining us for this live webinar, Hacking Habits. Love if you could post below in comments a habit that you would currently like to build or maybe a habit that you would currently like to get rid of. And again, over the next half hour and over the next few days, we will be working on, on building some of these good habits and on tearing down some of these bad habits. My name is Dan Williams. I'm the director of Range of Motion. I'm an exercise physiologist. Range of Motion is currently in its 13th year. And in 13 years, we have worked with many thousands of people people who are, again, looking to build good habits and looking to create behavior change. Guys, I would love if you could tag any of your friends who may be interested in this live webinar in the comments below. Um, hi Dawn, thank you for joining us. Um, also love guys, if you could share this post, if you think it may be of interest to people, whether you're watching this live or whether you are watching this uh, delayed on the delayed telecast. I'm just gonna share this around to some of the groups who are hoping to watch this event. Again guys, if you are just joining us, I would love if you could post in comments below a habit that you would look to build or a habit that you're looking to try and break. And we will be addressing this as we go over the course of this event. All right, guys, let's kick it off. And what I wanna do is I would like to, to talk, about, talk about what we're actually trying to do, talk about what we're aiming to do today. And it's very simple. Hi, Simon. Hi, Rebby. Thank you for joining us, guys. I'd love if you could post below in comments a habit that you are looking to try and build or break. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for joining us. The whole purpose, guys, of this is to try and create a behavior change. And basically, we're looking at existing on a continuum. So no matter who you are, no matter what level you're at, there's a certain point where you are currently sitting. And there's a certain point that you're trying to get to. And in between those two points, we have your continuum. Now you're sitting somewhere on that continuum at the moment. Thank you, Simon, for posting uh, the habit you would like to work on. Hi, Casey, thank you for joining us. Love if you could post in comments below a habit you're looking to build or break. So you'll be sitting somewhere on this continuum and all we wanna do is move you just a little further that way. So this is all about behavior change and we're not interested in changing your behavior for tomorrow or next week. We're interested in changing your behavior for the long term, a long term behavior change which is gonna create a consistent change and a consistent improvement in your life. So that's the crux of this whole event, working out ways that we can change your behavior to move yourself towards the other end of the continuum. Whether you get there or not, that's irrelevant, just moving you in that direction. Hi Fab, thanks for joining us. Hi Jules, thanks for joining us. So let me tell you about something that, that I've switched, a way that I've switched my thinking from when I was younger. I used to believe that you could educate people and you could motivate people and that would create a behavior change. Hi Mel, thanks for joining us. But an education and a motivation are not enough to create change. I used to believe that if people knew that something was good or bad for you, that would be enough to create that change. I heard a really scary fact recently. In the last couple of years, we've ticked over a billion people, that's a billion with a B, a billion people worldwide who smoke. There are a billion smokers worldwide. And I can bet that the vast majority of those people, the vast majority of those people who smoke, know that smoking is bad for you. But that education is not enough to make a change. 
Even if they're motivated to want to change, it's still not enough to make that change. So we need something more. We need something more than a what. We need something more than a why. And the thing we need is a how. We need to know how to create change. Because if we don't know how to create change, then it becomes impossible to do. And they actually did a bunch of research which really neatly addresses this point. And they took a big group of people and they split this group of people in two. Now, the people over this side, they gave them information on why exercise is good. They gave them information on the effects it has on reducing cardiovascular disease, how it helps your mental health, how good it was for your bones and your body and your muscles. The people over here, all they did was they said, we would like you to write down when you're gonna exercise, where you're going to be when you exercise, and what exercise you're actually going to do. Just write down those three things, where you'll be, what time it'll be, and what you'll do. And here's what happened. The people who were motivated, the people who were educated, the people who were inspired to start an exercise program, they stuck with their exercise 31% of the time. That's less than a third. The people who were more systematic about the process, who wrote, who wrote down the when, the where, the how, these people stuck with their exercise program over 90% of the time. So the rate of adherence to exercise was three times more in people who knew how they were gonna do something, not what or why they were going to do that thing. So let's unpack the, that a little bit more. Basically guys, there are six steps in your behavior change process. Six things that we're gonna work through. And this is gonna be the syllabus, if you will, for what we're gonna to cover today. We're gonna to look at values and motivation, and the motivation will be less important than you think. We're gonna look at outcome goals, where you actually wanna to get to. We're gonna look at process goals, how to actually get there. We're gonna look at how tweaking the environment around you and the things in your surroundings is gonna make it really easy for you to stick with your goals or maybe break some of those goals or bad habits that you don't want. Then we're gonna talk about how to actually start. Because once you know how to start, then you'll be able to create a change. You'll be able to get that momentum happening. And finally, we're gonna talk about how a start turns into habits and how the habits are fueled by willpower. So let's kick this off with values and motivation. Hi guys, welcome those of you who are just joining us. Jill, Dave, Nick, thank you guys. I'd love if you could post in comments below a habit that you would love to build or a habit that you would love to break. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go this evening or over the next few days, guys, if you are not watching this on the live broadcast. So let's first talk about values and about motivation. And this is, our, this is the first of our six steps in creating a behavior change. So what are values? Values are the things which are important to you. And when you look at the change you're trying to create, when you look at moving along this continuum of behavior change, if something is not important to you, it's not gonna happen. So if, if one of your goals is maybe to, to drop some body fat percentage, to change your body composition, but that doesn't really bother you. Maybe you're doing it for someone else. Maybe your doctor has told you to do it. If you don't value that change, it's absolutely not gonna happen. It may happen in the short term. There may be a short term change, but we have zero interest in short term changes. Hi Marty, thanks for joining us. Zero interest in short term changes. We're looking for a long term change here. So you must have the values that support the end result. And then you have to have a bit of motivation. But this motivation is not important as you might think. Hi Kirst, hi Mike, thanks for joining us guys. Not as important as you might think to be motivated. However, you must be motivated to start. So think of lighting a fire and you need those little bits of kindling, a little bit of paper to start that fire burning. That paper is not gonna continue that fire burning for the long run because it's, it's only gonna work for a short amount of time. Motivation is exactly the same. Motivation is not enough to create a long-term change, but motivation is that, that little spark that you need to create that change to, to start the process of change. Because motivation is, is up and down. It comes in waves, just like anything in life. If you look at climate or weather patterns. It comes in waves, peaks and troughs and seasons. If you look at the financial markets, it comes in waves. What we're interested in is the long-term trend, a long-term trend in climate patterns, a long-term trend in financial patterns, or in this case, a long-term trend in behavior, and that leads us to behavior change. 
But if you have these peaks and troughs of motivation, what it means is that you will only exercise, you will only eat healthy, you will only floss your teeth, you will only stop smoking when your motivation is high. And that is not enough. Because with peaks and troughs, your motivation is only high 50% of the time. And completing a behavior only 50% of the time is not enough to turn it into a habit. So there's our first step. You have to have the values that reflect the end process. Hi Kaz, thanks for joining us. And you also have to have the motivation to begin that change. Not to continue that change, but just to begin you that, to begin that change. So you wanna make a change, you're motivated to make that change. What's the next step? Well, the next step is to identify where we're actually going. And where we're going, the target or the destination of our process these are your outcome goals. Now there's nothing new here. You guys will know the importance of goals. You will know the importance of knowing where you are trying to head. Hi Amanda, thanks for joining us. Guys, if you are just joining, I'd love if you could take a moment just to post below a habit you're looking to build or break um, that you can look at the rest of this talk in the context of. So all an outcome goal is, is where you're trying to get to. What are you trying to do? What is the end result of the process of the habits that you're trying to create? Now, I'm gonna repeat something to you guys that I'm sure you have heard a thousand times in self-help books or motivational talks. And it's this concept of SMART goals, S-M-A-R-T. Now, of course, this is a massive cliche. The concept of SMART goals has been around for a long time. But as with most cliches, they are cliche for a reason because they work. So let's unpack this because there may be some stuff in here that you actually haven't heard before about these SMART goals. So each letter stands for a different element to make these goals effective. Firstly, the goals have to be specific. You have to paint a very clear picture of what it looks like. I want to eat healthier is not very specific. How do we measure health? How do we measure healthier? Where are you now? Secondly, the goal has to be measurable. You have to know whether you're actually doing it. So if your goal is to lose weight, losing weight is not enough. Maybe to say you wanna lose three kilos, that would be enough because you're now being specific. You know when you've achieved it. If you don't know when you're achieving that goal, then it's impossible to say if you've actually arrived. Next, A, the goal has to be action orientated, which means you have to have control over the completion of that goal. Now, maybe your goal is to win lotto, to win a million dollars. Now, sure, that would be great, but you don't have a lot of control over that process. You can't change whether or not that happens. You can't try harder. You can't have things within your control, which is gonna allow you to win lotto. So maybe not an effective goal. Now, these goals that are action oriented not only do you have to be in control, but you have to do it for you. Because here's the problem. If you're trying to do a goal which is conforming to someone else's wishes, to someone else's standards, to someone else's hopes and dreams, and to someone else's values, you're probably not gonna stick with it. So let's say that you go and see your doctor and they tell you that you have high resting blood glucose levels, that you're pre-diabetic and you're on the way to a future of chronic disease. And your doctor tells you to go and exercise. And you go home and you tell your husband or your wife or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your son or your daughter. And they tell you to exercise as well because they want you to hang around and grow old. But if you don't, if you don't value that, if you're not doing it for you, it's not going to work. So make sure when you're setting these goals, you are setting a goal which is meaningful to you. You cannot do it for someone else. Maybe when the times are good, it will work, but when the times are bad, it's not really gonna work very well. Make sure you're doing it for you. Make sure you are setting a goal that you want to achieve, not that someone else wants to achieve. Your goals have to be realistic. Now, we want them to be realistic, but we don't want them to be, to be too realistic. We don't want them to be too easy, and here's why. Science has found there's actually a relationship between how difficult a goal is and how likely we are to achieve it. So this is the difficulty of the goals, and this is the likelihood of achieving that goal. And we get this, this inverted U model. We get this relationship where a goal which is too easy, which is not difficult at all, it's gonna be very hard, oh, so, so, it, it's, 
It's gonna be almost impossible for you to achieve. Now that's counterintuitive. You think, well, if this goal's easy, surely it will be easy for me to achieve. But here's what happens. You set an easy goal, and you think, well, this goal's easy. I don't really need to work towards this. So maybe you deadlift 95 kilos. Your goal is to deadlift 100 kilos. It's probably gonna happen just as a result, as a process of your normal training. So you can't set goals that are too easy because then you're not really gonna to work towards it. And surprise, surprise, if you're not working towards something, it's probably not gonna be achieved. On the other end of the scale, if you set a goal which is too difficult, so using that same example, if you can currently deadlift 95 kilos and you set a goal to deadlift 150 by the end of the year, it's probably not gonna happen. In fact, it's so far away from where you are that before you even begin the process of training and trying to achieve this goal, you've given up because you know it's too difficult. So we have this sweet spot, this Goldilocks area in the middle where the goals aren't too easy, they aren't too difficult, they're just right. And the science has told us that there's a name for this, this area, this shaded area, this sweet spot in the middle. These are goals which we consider to be moderately difficult. Not too easy, not too hard, just a little bit above difficult, that do stretch you. Because if you're being stretched by the goal, you have to allocate your time, your attention, your resources, and your effort towards it, and there's a greater chance that that goal is going to happen. Here's what happens, guys, if you always set goals which are too difficult, and this is really important. Do you guys have one of those friends who's always late? Maybe you should tag them in comments below. Someone who always turns up late, and at least they're predictably late, so at least you know that it's going to happen. And this person always turns up late to birthdays and dinners, you always know you're gonna be waiting for them, to the point that you start telling them that you've made a reservation for quarter to seven instead of seven, because you know then they'll at least turn up on time. Everyone has a friend like that. And this friend has conditioned you to know that they're always going to be late. Hi Rich, thanks for joining us. This friend has conditioned you to know that they're always going to be late. And that's exactly what you do to yourself when you set goals which are too difficult. Because if you continually and repeatedly set goals that are too hard for you to achieve, that are too far on this side of this inverted U model, then you don't achieve them. So you set another difficult goal and you don't achieve that. And you set another difficult goal and you don't achieve that either. And you are conditioning your mind to expect yourself to not achieve your goals. And suddenly, the whole process of setting goals, of having these outcomes that we're working towards, it becomes completely irrelevant because you've conditioned yourself to know that goals are not important to you and they're not something that you can do. Set goals that are moderately difficult, but not too difficult. You don't wanna be that friend who's always late. You don't wanna be that person who sets goals knowing that they're not gonna achieve them because then the process becomes completely worthless. And finally, the T of SMART goals. And the T is to make these goals time-based. The reason we have to make them time-based is because of something called Parkinson's Law. So maybe you're, maybe you're a uni student who's watching this. Maybe, maybe you, you work for someone who sets you work deadlines. Maybe you're self-employed and you have these self-imposed deadlines. And Parkinson's Law tells us that the amount of time it takes to complete a task it expands to fill the amount of time we have available to complete that task. So if you're a uni student and you have an assignment due on the 30th of June, you will finish that assignment midnight, the night before on the 29th of June, just when it's due. Now if that same assignment was due a week from now, then you do it a week from now. Let's say your boss says to you, I need that report on my desk by 5 p.m. Friday. At 4.59 on the Friday, the report hits the desk, not a minute earlier. If your boss had said to you, I want that report on my desk by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, you would have that report on her desk by 5 p.m. on Tuesday because the amount of time it takes to do a task expands to fill the amount of time we have available to do that task. So if your goals are open-ended, if your goal is to deadlift 100 kilos, then theoretically that could take you 30 years. But if you put a timestamp on that, if you put a deadline, if you put a date on that, then there's more chance of you achieving that goal because it gives you a sense of urgency and you're more likely to create a positive change. 
So these are our SMART goals. Specific, measurable, action oriented including doing it for you. Realistic, moderately difficult, and time-based. So for example, a SMART goal would be, I would like to lose 70 kilos, specific and measurable, by the 31st of December, 2019. It gives you a deadline, it's specific, it's measurable, you are in control, and it's a realistic goal. Maybe that's not realistic if you currently weigh 200 kilos, but if you currently weigh 80 kilos, maybe this is something that you can work towards. So, these are your outcome goals. Guys, what I would love you to do, whether you are watching this live tonight, and hi Bryn, thank you for joining us, whether you're watching this live tonight or you're watching this delayed in the next few days, I would love for you guys right now to post in comments below a goal that you have. So, those of you who have been able to post a habit that you would like to build or break, I know a lot of you have posted those already, thank you very much for that. I'd love if you guys could now jump on, back in comments below, and just write down a goal that you would like, which is gonna help lead you towards that habit. Or maybe a goal that you would have to start to create this habit in order to achieve. Make sure it's specific, make sure it's measurable, make sure it's action oriented realistic, and time-based. Post that below right now, guys. So an outcome goal is where we're trying to get to. An outcome goal is your destination. And at the start of this talk, I talked about this continuum that we're looking on, working towards an end result. But what's much more important than that is how we get there. Because an outcome goal could just be called a dream if we don't know the process to get there. So once you have these outcome goals, once you know where you're going, once you know your destination, then we can start to put together some steps and processes to actually take us towards this destination. And these are your process goals. And really, if you think about it, and this is where we come back on the whole topic of this webinar, which are these habits, all a process goal is, is a planned habit. So you having a process goal is, is you creating a habit. It's an intent to create a habit which is gonna get you towards your outcome goal. A process goal is how we plan our habits and habits are how we create our long-term change. Your process goal should be really easy. The mistake a lot of people make is they make these process goals quite difficult. They make them hard to achieve. And if you have these barriers to entry, and we'll, we'll expand on this a little bit more when we talk about the environment that we're trying to create to make these goals conducive and to make these habits easy to create. If your process goals are too difficult, if the step is too big, it's not gonna work for you. It has to be very easy to achieve. It has to be so stupidly easy to achieve that there's never a reason that you couldn't do it. So if your goal is to be able to do 10 push-ups. Maybe a good process goal for that would be to do one push-up every day. Now, even if you forget and you go to bed, you can roll out of bed and you can do that one push-up. Make these so ridiculously easy to complete that you never have any reason not to complete this goal. If you have process goals, if you have these little steps, these steps up to that first floor, instead of having to go from zero up to the first floor, if you have these little steps, it does a very interesting thing to your brain. When you achieve something, you get this little, this little punch of dopamine, which is this chemical that makes you feel good. Now, when you have this dopamine hit in your brain, in your body, you get this positive feedback, you feel really good about yourself. Now, they've actually measured the amount of dopamine which is released with small goals and with big goals. And here's what they found. As you'd expect, you do get a bigger dopamine hit, a bigger hit of these feel-good chemicals when you achieve a big goal, something you've been working to for a long time. But the interesting thing is, if you set lots of these little process goals, if you add together how much dopamine has been released, it's much, much more than if you just have this one outcome-based goal. So let's say maybe you achieve a big goal and it gives you 100 dopamine, whatever that means. If you were to achieve five little steps on the way to get to that big goal, each one is gonna give you a 50 dopamine hit. So by the time you achieve it, not only have you achieved this big hit of dopamine, but you've achieved three pretty good hits of dopamine as you go. And each time you get this dopamine hit, it makes you feel happier, it reinforces your behavior, and then there's more chance of you carrying on. So that's the science and the actual physiology behind why it's such a good idea to have these, these smaller process-based goals to get you to your big goals. 
The problem a lot of people make, because remember your process goals, we're, we're also calling them planned habits. The problem that a lot of people make when they're setting these process-based goals is they make them too difficult, as we've talked about, but they make them for their future selves. And the interesting thing is, and what the science tells us, is that we actually perceive our future selves as different people. So what they did is they put people in a brain scanning machine. They put electrodes on their head and they said, let's see which areas of the brain light up when people are thinking about different things. So they put these electrodes on, on people's heads and they said to them, okay, I would like you to think about yourself in 10 years. And they looked at which areas of their brain lit up. Then they said to them, I'd like you to think about yourself right now as you are today. And different areas of their brain lit up. And here's the kicker. They then showed them a photo of a complete stranger. And the areas of their brain that lit up when they were thinking about a complete stranger were absolutely identical to the areas of their brain that were lighting up when they thought of their future selves. And here's what that tells us. We think of our future selves as a completely different person. We don't perceive them as future me, we perceive them as someone else. So if you're setting these little process goals, which are gonna get you to your final outcome, set little process goals, set little steps that you yourself would do today. If you don't think you would be prepared to complete this behavior today, I promise you future you is definitely not gonna do it. So set these process goals for current you, things that you would do now, and then there's much more chance that you're gonna complete them in the future because there's very little chance that your value systems are going to change between now and later. So don't kick the can down the road and let future Dan deal with this problem. Make sure it's a solution that you yourself would be able to work with now. So let's jump back to the big outcome goal that we talked about, the example I gave you, and let's have a think about what some process goals could be for that. And you guys who have posted your, your goals below, your outcome goals below, feel free to have a think about what processes you could have for those. So the example I gave you, the SMART goal we had for that weight loss goal was, I will lose five kilos to weigh 70 kilos by the 31st of December 2019. We then tape onto the end of that our process-based goals. I will do that by exercising at least four days a week, any type of exercise, and by eating no more than one form of processed foods per day. So now not only do we have a destination, but we have a couple of steps in terms of how we can get to that destination. So we have the values and we have the motivation to want to start. We have an outcome goal, we have a place we're trying to get to. We have our process goals, which are the steps to actually get there. The next thing we need to do is we need to create an environment. And this is probably the most important step. And this is where most people fall down because it's very difficult to change people. It's very, very difficult to change behavior, but it's easy to change what's around us. It's very difficult to have the self-control not to go and grab some chocolate from the pantry every night after dinner but it's very easy to just not buy that chocolate in the first place. And then we don't need that self-control. And when we talk about willpower in a moment, you'll see how this really does make sense. The first thing you wanna do when you're changing your environment is look for things that you're already doing really well. Now, I heard a really great story about how this is effective. And this is a story about a guy who worked for a global aid agency. And this aid agency that he worked for, they wanted to help to address the problems of childhood malnutrition in an underdeveloped country. But they had a low budget and the people who were on the ground in the country, they didn't really want him there. So they said to him, here's $50,000. We want you to solve malnutrition in this entire country. Pretty unlikely. He didn't have a lot of resources. He didn't have a lot of support on the ground. They'd been working on this for decades and decades and decades to try and solve this horrible problem of child malnutrition. And the mistake they'd made is that they had gone around and they had traveled to these villages, they'd looked in these villages, and they'd said, okay, the kids who are suffering from the most malnutrition, what are they doing wrong? What's wrong in these cases? What are these villages doing wrong? What he did with his limited resources and his limited budget was the opposite. He looked for what he called bright spots. He looked at places where 
the kids were not suffering from malnutrition because he figured if we could identify what those things were, we could then just emulate those in other families and in other villages. So with his $50,000, he went in and he got a small army of locals. And he asked them to go around and have a look at what was happening in the huts, in the mud huts in these villages. And here's the difference. In some of these huts, the kids were suffering from severe malnutrition and the average life expectancy was under 30. In other huts, the kids seemed healthy and there was no difference in income of the family. The parents had the same occupations. They had the same access to food and clean water. So what was the difference? They dug a little deeper, a little deeper to find out what these bright spots were. And what they discovered was interesting. They found out that the parents of the kids who were healthier, they'd be working in the paddy fields during the day and a lot of the crops there were sweet potatoes. So they'd be caring for these plantations of sweet potatoes and working in the paddy fields. And the parents of the healthy kids, they did just two things. The first thing they did is when they were tending for the sweet potatoes, they'd pull a couple of leaves off the top of each plant. And when they were in the paddy fields, there were these little uh, prawns, like little freshwater shrimp that would be swimming in the paddy fields. And they'd put these in a bucket. And they'd put them in a bucket and they'd put the leaves from the sweet potatoes in the bucket. And then they'd go back and they'd throw these in the pot that the whole family ate from. And by doing these two things, these kids were getting a little bit of protein from these shrimp and some vitamins and a lot of micronutrients from these leaves. And then instead of feeding the kids every day for one big meal, they would feed the kids every day with two small meals. So we've got the healthy kids here are eating some extra shrimp, some extra leaves, and they're eating twice a day. The kids over here, they're not eating the shrimp or the leaves, and they're eating once a day. And they found that just by knowing this, just by doing this, just by having this small behavior change, by changing the environment, the families were able to create healthier kids, and then they use those families, they use the parents in those families to spread the education. And using $50,000, they were almost able to completely wipe out childhood malnutrition in these countries, in these countries where for decades they'd not been able to touch it. So what can you do? Where can you look in your life, the habits that you wanna try and create, where can you look where you can say, this is a bright spot. This is something I'm already doing well. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. This is working for me. Let's continue that process. So create the environment and create such a low barrier to entry that it's almost impossible not to do. So if you want to achieve something, say to yourself, well, what are the obstacles standing between me and this? What's stopping me from doing this? Am I not educated enough? Learn. Is there no one to hold me accountable? Get someone to hold you accountable. What is it that's standing in the way? And then one by one, bring those barriers down. Because if you can start to remove those barriers, it becomes a lot easier to hit the process goals that we're trying to achieve. It should be very easy for you to start because everything we're talking about so far is just planning. But we want to make it so easy to start that it's ridiculous. So easy to start that it's easier to start than not to. And they've done a bunch of research into what they call the gym clothes effect. And they found that people who sleep in the clothes that they're planning to go to the gym in the following morning, they go to the gym 300% more than those people who don't. Because you're just making it easy, you're taking down a barrier to entry. Now you, you sort of think, well, it's such a low barrier. It's such a low barrier to entry. I'm not gonna fail to go to the gym just because I don't have my clothes on, but people do. 300% difference. So look at these little barriers, these tiny little things, because we're inherently lazy. Human beings are lazy, and that's fine, as long as you know that you're lazy and take advantage of it. The problem arises when you think that future you, which again we perceive as a different person, we think that future you is gonna be less lazy than you are. They're not. They're gonna be more lazy, if anything. So make it so easy for future Dan to do this behavior that it's easier to do than it is not to do. Like I said, it is really, really difficult to make people change. People are stubborn as well as being lazy. Very, very difficult to make people change. However, we can change the environment. So by changing the environment, it can be a really effective way of making sure that we have our behavior change. So guys, what I'd like you to do is post something below, post a bright spot, post something you already do 
really well. Something that you're doing really well currently to do with your habit. So maybe you wanna try and sleep more. And maybe you're on the phone, on your phone, you're in front of screens, but something that you are doing well, maybe you have a nice cool room, or maybe you have a hot shower before bed, which is gonna help you sleep. Look at things that you're already doing well, because if you do things that already look good, things that are already working for you, just try and emulate those, don't try and reinvent the wheel. As we go, guys, um, if you do have any questions, I will address some of your questions at the end. Also, any questions that I don't have time to touch on tonight, um, I will cover over the next few days. Jules says, Dan, you've obviously never tried sleeping in a sports bra. I have, let's not go into that one, Jules. Uh, okay, so post something below that you already do well to do with your habit. Post your bright spot below, and let's get into starting. Because all of this stuff we've talked about so far is just putting you in the right headspace. It's about creating the right environment. It's about identifying the destination that we're trying to get to. But we haven't actually begun the behavior change yet. And eventually, you do have to start. So let's talk about starting. We talked about a continuum. We talked about the fact that you have to get from where you are now, you are here, to where you wanna be, future you. And there's this process that we have to go through. Now the problem that people face when they start to begin this process of change is that they believe, as I pointed out, that you are here, but you're actually not. You're not here, because this is zero. This is 100. And the problem people face and the mistake that they make mentally is thinking that they're here. Not the case at all. Look for ways that you've already begun your journey. There's a really good example of that in a piece of research they did in coffee shops. And you know you get those little uh, loyalty cards where you punch 10 holes and you get a free coffee to get people coming back and buying coffee from your coffee shop. Well, they got two coffee shops in the same town. In coffee shop A, they, they gave these little uh, loyalty cards and they had eight squares in them. So once you punched eight holes, you'd get a free coffee. The coffee shop on the other side of town, same loyalty cards, but they had 10 squares in them. Two more that they had to achieve before they could get that coffee. Now you'd think, okay, well, the people who've got eight holes to punch, they'll surely get their free coffee before the people who've got 10 holes to punch. Not the case, because there's one thing that I haven't told you. The coffee shop that had 10 holes that needed punching, the first time you came in, when they first give you that card, they sort of looked around as if they were breaking the rules to make sure the boss wasn't watching, and they punched two holes. They pre-punched two holes, and then they gave them that card with two holes already punched. So as far as this person was concerned, they had already begun their journey. Instead of being at zero out of 100, they were already 20% of the way there. And what this did is created an effect where the people who had already begun their journey, they actually got their free coffee sooner. Even though these people had eight coffees that they had to drink, these people had eight coffees that they had to drink, the perception here, because they'd already begun their journey. The perception was they'd already begun, so therefore they were closer to the end. In actuality, they were still eight coffees from getting their free drink. So, when you're, when you're looking to start, you're not looking to start. You're looking to continue. Find something you're already doing and build on top of that. But still, this perception of starting is the biggest effort. So, everyone's been in that situation where maybe your car's broken down or you're helping someone push the car. The hardest bit is overcoming that initial inertia. Taking that car from zero to something. And as soon as you've started it moving, as soon as you've created that little bit of movement, it's then easier to keep that car moving. Starting is the biggest effort. Overcoming that inertia is the biggest effort. And this process isn't easy. And there are little tricks and hacks like we're talking about that can make it easier, but this process isn't easy. But once you do start, it does get easier. The mistake that a lot of people make, and we, we spoke about the fact at the beginning of this webinar, we spoke about the fact that you have to have the values and you have to have the motivation. And a lot of people rely on their motivation too much. And this is what happens when they do that. People think of behavior change as a linear model. They think that first you need to be able to do something. K 
can do. Then they think that you need to be able to want to do that thing. And then and only then do they believe you can actually do that thing. And people perceive changing behaviors and building habits as a linear model, where you have to do this first, then you can do this, and finally you can actually, you can actually start, you can actually do that thing. Now there's a problem with this. These are the people who think that you have to get fit before you can go to the gym. And of course that doesn't make any sense. That's like saying that um, you, you have to be hydrated before you have a glass of water, or you have to be clean before you can get in the shower. It doesn't make sense. How about these people? These are the people who are slaves to their levels of motivation. And again, motivation is cyclical. Peaks and troughs and waves, it goes up and down. So these people, they'll complete the behavior when they feel like it, but when they don't feel like it, it's not gonna happen because they are slaves to their motivation. So let's change this model a little bit. Let's take it from being a linear model to a cycle. And the thing with cycles is that there's no start point and there's no end point. So you can begin at any point here and that will then feed back and create a behavior change. So instead of saying, I need to get fit before I go to the gym, instead of saying, I'll go to the gym when I feel like it, when I'm motivated, start by doing it, start by starting. Because if you begin here, if you start by just completing that behavior, that will teach you, you will realize that you, you can do it. And when you realize that you can do it, that will motivate you and you will want to do it. And the more you want to do it, the more you'll do it, and the more you do it, the more you realize that you can do it. So start by beginning. Don't be a slave to motivation. Don't be a slave to this, this process of behavior change must be linear. Instead of can do, want to do, do, start with do. And remember that motivation doesn't cause action. Action is what causes motivation. So you have to, you have to begin. You have to begin by beginning. And when you do begin, don't be too hard on yourself. Because what we need are, as we talked about, these little hits of dopamine as you go to keep you happy, to keep you effective, and to keep you on that process to creating long-term habits. And we'll really double down on the habits in a moment when we talk about how to create them. So if you can, if you can start, if you can begin, and just tick boxes, and judge the success of your habits, not on how good they are, but on the fact that they exist. So if you're trying to not eat too much chocolate, or if you're trying to drink more water, or if you're trying to exercise well, if you're trying to exercise well, it's either a win or a loss, it's binary. If you exercise, it's a win. I don't mind how much you lifted. I don't care what time you did it in. I don't care how far you ran. All I care is that you did some exercise. Did you do a single squat? Tick, you tick that box, that goes down as a win. Judge the success of this process, not on how, how well you did, but on the fact that you did something. And if you can do that, it's gonna reinforce that behavior. And in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to create this long-term change. We're trying to reinforce these patterns to create habits. You wanna try and judge the success on the completion, not on the loftiness of your achievement. So this is talking about getting started and getting started is important but how we build habits, we build habits by not stopping. If we can not stop, then you'll keep going, that wheel keeps turning, that car keeps moving, and it's much easier to keep something moving than it was to get it moving in the first place. So guys, what I'd like you to do, we've talked about maybe what your outcome-based goals are, you've talked about some habits that need to get you there. What I'd like you to do now is post below something that is related to your habit that is in some way related to your outcome goal that we're looking at, post the way you've already begun. So maybe you're looking to exercise more. If you're looking to exercise more, it implies you're already doing some exercise. Maybe you're not doing any exercise, but maybe you are. Maybe you're walking to the fridge and back every day, so you are exercising. Even if that's it, look for a way that you have already begun. Look for those two hole punches that you've already got in that coffee card to get you that free coffee and post those below guys. Let me know something you are already doing which is taking you on the road to where you wanna be. And what that's gonna do is that's gonna help to kickstart the process, overcome that inertia and let you know that your car is actually already rolling. It's not going from zero, 
it's going from 20%. And if it's at 20%, you think, well, it's only a two out of 10, but you're already 20% of the way there. I think that's a pretty good start. All right, so once you've begun, now we get down to the real crux of this event, of this webinar. Let's talk about habits, and let's talk about how we get habits, and let's talk about how willpower is what we use to fuel our habits. So all a habit is, is you sticking with your process goals for the long term. So you remember we've got these outcome goals, the target, your destination, the place that you're trying to get to, and then you've got these little steps along the way. Now, if you keep completing the behaviors of these little steps, those are the things that get you to your outcome goal. And if you keep doing them, that's called a habit. Now, the way that we fuel habits, because you can't just switch them on, they don't just happen. We have to fuel them and we have to start the burn and we start the burn by having these small behaviors and by using our willpower. So what is willpower? Willpower is you having the strength to be able to make the correct choice. If you have two decisions, again, it's a very binary choice here. Is this decision gonna get me to the process goal, uh, to the outcome goal rather that I'm trying to get to? Or is this decision gonna get me to my outcome goal? Which one is gonna get me closer to my final destination? It becomes a very easy way to make decisions. If you're trying to eat healthier, do I eat the chocolate? Do I not eat the chocolate? It becomes a very easy decision because it's binary. However, if you have a decision to make, there's a 50-50 chance that you're gonna make the wrong decision. There's a 50-50 chance that you're gonna eat the chocolate instead of not eating that chocolate. And that takes a bit of willpower. And willpower can be depleted, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and we'll talk about why trying to use willpower all the time is not only exhausting, but it's not sustainable in the long term. The reason it's not sustainable is it's not on autopilot. And that's what we're trying to create. We're trying to make the things that are healthy for you happen automatically, autopilot, cruise control. There are two parts of your brain which deal with your habits and behaviors. And 45% of everything you do, so think of every little thing you do in life, from the moment you wake up until the moment you go to bed, 45% of those things are automatic. You don't have to think about them. They are mindless chains of behavior that lead you and guide you through your life. Now, of course, 45%, if those 45% of things are, are negative things, are bad habits, as opposed to good habits, then we've got some serious issues because you're on autopilot going over a cliff. That's not what we want. So these things need to be good. So all we need to do really is take the things that we want more of, and we need to take them out of the part of our brain which requires thinking that's not autopilot. We need to take them out of that part of the brain and put them in the part of the brain which is autopilot. So the autopilot part of our brain, is called the basal ganglia. And it's right at the base of our brain, it's been there for a long time which is why habits and routines are seen not just in humans. The prefrontal cortex, however, at the front of our brain, that's what some people call the more human part of our brain, higher order thinking and reasoning and decision making. Now, if you're having to make a decision every day, I will go and exercise. Should I, shouldn't I? Yes, I will. Um, chocolate, should I, shouldn't I? Mm, no, I won't. Um, drinking too much sugary drink, should I, shouldn't I? If you're making these decisions constantly, there's a 50% chance that you're gonna make the wrong choice. So how do we move these habits from the non-automatic into the autopilot? How do we make things that we wanna do more of automatic? And again, we do it first by training our willpower, by consistently making the choice to, to do what's gonna lead us towards our goal. Willpower is really important, in fact, Willpower and having good willpower is one of the biggest predictors of your success in life in the future. And they know this because they did a piece of research called the Marshmallow Study. And what they did is they got kids, little six-year-olds, and they put them in a room and they sat them down at a desk and they sat a marshmallow in front of them on that desk. Then the researchers said, oh, we just have to leave the room for a moment. You sit here. You can eat the marshmallow if you want, but if you don't eat the marshmallow, when I come back, I'll give you another one. So what the researchers were doing is they were asking these kids to put off a little bit of short-term sugar hit for the promise of some long-term return. They were effectively asking these kids, can you put up with a little bit of discomfort early in life 
for a reward later in life. The researchers left the room. A couple of minutes later, they came back in. Some kids couldn't wait, they'd eaten the marshmallow. Some kids could wait, and they got a second one. They got a reward for having good willpower. But the research didn't end there. And the research got really interesting when they, they took these kids and they had a look at them five years later and 10 years later and 15, 20, 25 years later. And they found that these children, these little five-year-olds who had been able to resist a marshmallow, a little bit of short-term gain for the promise of long-term gain, they had more successful relationships. They had higher paying jobs. They had more fulfilling relationships with their family. In just about every metric by which you could possibly measure success, these kids were miles ahead. So this willpower really is this meta skill, this ability to say, well, no, I'm not gonna get this reward now because I know in the future my reward will be stronger. And willpower can be trained. That's the good news. Willpower can be trained because your willpower is it's like a muscle. And just like a muscle, you can, you can train it and make it stronger. If you wanna make your legs stronger, you make them stronger by doing more squats. If you wanna make your willpower stronger, you consistently make choices that lead you to the outcome goal that you've set yourself, that take you to, that lead you towards, which predispose you to the final outcome or the final destination that you're looking for. You can strengthen that willpower muscle. And by strengthening that willpower muscle, you're able to then, in the future, have a good return on a little bit of discomfort earlier in your life. So using this willpower, this is how we kickstart this process of having habits. But it gets pretty exhausting because again, just like a muscle, your willpower can fatigue. And if your willpower fatigues, you don't have it anymore and then you start making poor choices. And you guys would all see this in your life. It's very rare that you'd have a really unhealthy breakfast. As you go throughout the day, you get to mid-afternoon and your food gets less and less healthy. And then at dinner, you just can't be stuffed and you order something easy, you order something simple, you order something with a low barrier to entry and it's probably not that healthy. Because what's happened? Over the course of the day, your willpower muscle has slowly been depleted. Over the course of the day, you've had to make decisions about work or study or relationships or interactions with other people. And your willpower muscle has fatigued and fatigued and fatigued. So then when it comes to making a choice about health or not health, about moving in the direction of your outcome or moving away from your outcome, you make the easy decision. You make the lazy decision. And if we jump back a couple of minutes when we talked about environment, if you can make the easy decision, the healthy decision, if you can make the easy decision, the decision that leads you towards your outcome-based goal, then it doesn't matter if your willpower is depleted. So use your willpower, but it won't last forever. So how is that gonna help us? Well, because your willpower doesn't last forever, because it won't always be there, because it can be fatigued, can we come up with a way where we don't need to rely on our willpower? Yes, we can, and that is by building habits. You need willpower to start this process. So when you start to build habits, if this is time, when you start to build habits, you need a lot of willpower. You need to consistently make those choices that are gonna lead you to your outcome-based goal. But over time, the amount of willpower that you need drops off very quickly. Now when you start this process, you start trying to build this habit, there's very little habit there. So you're using a lot of willpower, a lot of mental energy, a lot of decision making, a lot of these binary decisions, but you're getting very little return. Lots of willpower, no habit. But over time, if you use your willpower enough, habit becomes automatic, it goes into that part of your brain, into the basal ganglia, which is your brain and your body and your behavior starting to run on autopilot because you've consistently made the choices. Willpower is less important because now it becomes a habit. These neural pathways in our brain start to run automatically. So imagine you've moved house or you've started a new job. And for a couple of weeks, you have to think about which way to drive, which way to drive. And you may find yourself taking the wrong freeway exit because your brain is running on autopilot. It's running on cruise control because that's what you're used to. But in time, you consciously make the decision to go the other way to your new house, to your new job. Those neural pathways in your brain start to change. And this is the sweet spot, this point right here. 
And the reason this is the sweet spot is because this right here is the point where the behavior becomes easier to do than it is not to do. And when that happens, it's become automatic. Think of something like brushing your teeth. It's easier for you to wake up in the morning and brush your teeth because it's habit. It would actually take willpower and mental energy for you to wake up and decide for some reason that you weren't going to brush your teeth that day. Really good example of how maybe when you were a kid it took willpower, but after a while that willpower is now zero. It doesn't deplete any of your willpower muscle to wake up and brush your teeth in the morning because it's now habit. So habits can be difficult to kickstart early on, but consistently make those decisions. Train your willpower by saying which choice of these two decisions is gonna take me towards the outcome that I desire. Choose the one that's gonna take you there. Do that consistently enough and you will no longer need your willpower because that behavior will become a habit. When it's easier to do something than not to do that thing, that then becomes a long-term behavior change and that's what this is all about. So guys, let's wrap this up. Let's talk about this process of behavior change. Firstly, you need to have some values and some motivation. The values need to be supporting where you wanna to get to. They have to be your values. You have to value the end result. And you have to have the motivation to want to make the change. Again, motivation is not enough because it's cyclic, it's peaks and troughs. It's not, a lot, it's not enough in the long run, but you need that to get you going. Once you've got that, you need to know where that destination is. You need your outcome goal, a smart goal, specific, measurable, action oriented something that you have control over, realistic but moderately difficult, and time-based, so you're not just expanding this task out to infinity. Once you have your outcome-based goals, you need some process goals, aka planned habits, because if you can plan your habits, it will allow you to then take those little steps and get those multiple dopamine hits to get you towards where you're going to go. Then you need to tweak the environment. How can you look for bright spots in the environment around you? How can you change the environment so, key concept, it becomes easier to do than not to do? It's easier for you to brush your teeth than it is not to brush your teeth because it's become a habit. So change the environment and then start. But remember when you're starting, you're not starting from zero, you're starting from 20%, which means you're already 20% of the way there. And it's easier to keep a car rolling than it is to overcome that inertia and start it rolling in the first place. So once you have that environment tweaked and changed to make it as conducive as, as you possibly can to tear down those barriers to your behavior, then you start. Or in actuality, you continue because you've already started. And you understand that you don't fuel behavior change by first wanting to do something or being able to do something or by having some sort of motivation, you, you start this process by starting this process because starting is cyclical. Motivation doesn't drive action. Use action to drive your motivation. Once you've started, consistently make the choices that lead you in the direction of your outcome. This is how you build willpower and willpower is a muscle. It can be fatigued, it can be strengthened just like any other muscle in your body. If you make enough of these correct decisions, you'll finally get to this sweet spot, this point where the behavior that you want, which leads to the process goals, which lead to your outcome goals, which lead to your destination, the behavior actually becomes easier to do than not to do. And once it's easier for you to do that behavior, it's hands off, it's autopilot, You've hacked your habits and you get to choose the direction that you head in the future. Okay, guys, I hope this has been useful to you. Um, heaps of comments. Thank you for that, guys. I will go through and answer your questions and we'll start a little bit of a dialogue and hopefully kickstart this process towards a long-term change for you. If I can help you with anything further, guys, obviously we're gonna be super active in comments below. So I'd love if you could post your thoughts, any takeaways that you had. Again, please share this with someone you think would find this valuable. Hopefully we can spread this and, and help some more people, maybe tag some people below. And those of you who have interacted in the comments, we will we'll talk about and maybe give you guys some strategies for your specific goals, planned habits, and your planned behavior change. So thanks very much, guys. If I can help you with anything else, the best way to get in touch with me, aside from comments below, is through my email, which is dan at rangeofmotion.net.au. If you are interested in more about what Range of Motion does, jump on rangeofmotion.net.au, and from there, you can have a look at our 
individualized programming, our exercise at our facility here in Perth, um, our nutrition coaching, which is launching in January 2019, or anything else that we can help you with. Guys, please reach out. Thank you very much for spending some time on your Friday night or for watching it later for those of you who are, and, uh, and I will see you again next time. Thanks very much.